She was appointed as part of the first federal cabinet to have achieved gender parity. And so, Patty Haidu wasted no time as the minister responsible for the status of women by targeting what she says is a prerequisite for gender equality, putting an end to gender-based violence. Patty Haidu is the Liberal MP for Thunder Bay Superior North, and she joins us now for more. It's nice to have you in this studio. Nice to be here. Thank you. We took you. our program to Thunder Bay a year and a half ago, and you were the nominated candidate, so we met then. We did. And here you are. And here I am. Politics is a funny business, eh? One I wouldn't have predicted uh, this particular <laughs> journey, no. There you go. Uh, Minister, let's start by just putting up some of the stats from your ministry so we can sort of set the table for the discussion to come. Sheldon, if you would, thank you for these graphics. Uh, young women age 15 to 24, are the most at risk of experiencing violence. Indigenous women are twice as likely to experience violence as Indigenous men, and three times more likely to experience violence than non-Indigenous people. Women with disabilities are twice as likely to report severe physical violence and three times as likely to be forced into sexual activity. Those who are homosexual or bisexual are three times more likely than heterosexuals to be victims of violence. And women who are seniors are at a higher risk of emotional and sexual abuse compared to men who are seniors. This is uh, just an enormous undertaking that needs to be dealt with here. I'm told you are planning a national strategy to combat this. Any idea yet how the strategy would work? We're starting to get some ideas of where we can contribute for sure at the federal level. And uh, I spent the summer, as you may know, traveling across the country coast to coast to coast, as we say, and mm -hmm. talking to women, uh, talking to frontline organizations and academics and pe people who have survived uh, gender-based violence of all different kinds. And it was incredibly helpful to do that. Um, we know, for example, you've given some data points, but we know, for example, that the last comprehensive assessment of women's experience with violence in this country was held in 1993. Uh, and nothing since. So, so it's time for an update. So we don't really get a good, we don't really have a good sense of what people's experiences are. Um, we know that uh, the kinds of money that we are investing right now across the federal government fall w w over the range of maybe 10 to 12 or 14 agencies and programs that there's very little communication, if any, between those different departments or, or programs, uh, that the money that we're spending is not uh, being well assessed. We're not doing very good evaluations of whether or not the money that we're investing in prevention or treatment or support for survivors or any of that is actually resulting in the kinds of effects that we'd like to see. What makes you think you can make a dent in any of that? Well, I think one of the things is that this is the first time that the government of Canada has had a minister solely focused on gender equality. I can tell you that now that I understand how the government works, how ministerial portfolios work to attack, attach gender equality to someone's uh, massive portfolio of labor or health, I can understand why it was not a focus for uh, for the government in the past. It, it, is a, it is a full portfolio of its so you, own. You need a dedicated you minister to make You need a dedicated voice, absolutely. Well, I think people, uh, people in Thunder Bay know, but maybe outside the rest of the province don't know. Your background makes you, in some respects, uh, ideal for this portfolio, right? What'd you do? Well, I, I worked in public health, uh, first and foremost, spent nine years in public health as a planner in the area of substance use and alcohol. Uh, during that process, I wrote the Thunder Bay Drug Strategy, which uh, was unanimously ratified by our city council, drew on the experience of Vancouver and Toronto and other large cities that had done similar work. And then after that, I was, uh, I was the executive director of a large homeless shelter, the largest in northwestern Ontario that uh, shelters men, uh, women, and young people over 16. We are, this is an odd way to put it, but I guess thanks to the appalling presidential campaign in the United States right now. We are learning a lot more about uh, this issue. Uh, but let me get your view. What impact do you believe gender-based violence or harassment have on women? Oh, it's a tremendous impact. I, I, I think about, and I think it's, I think unless you, quite frankly, aren't, uh, you know, I, I think if you have an experience that you do to under, don't understand how much it limits your capacity as a woman. That's why I'm asking. Uh, First of all, women are taught to be afraid. They're taught to be afraid of the dark, of uh, going places alone, of uh, back alleys, of, of uh, you know, of the very real risk that they can be victimized if they're alone or if they're in an area or if they're, you know, if they're if they're vulnerable in any way. So that uh, very right out of the gates, you're you're taught to be afraid, and that your lim your options are limited in terms of your own personal freedom. But more than that, I think when you have a woman that's uh, either experiencing violence in 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 her community in her home. Um, 
the primary need to stay safe actually takes over her capacity to look at, at, at other aspirations that she may have. Um, mm. You know, aspirations, whether it's if it's a young woman education, uh, if it's uh, aspirations around earning a living or, or growing her career, or, or, or it even affects your capacity to parent your children uh, if you have children. And so uh, this is a huge problem. If you, we cannot reach gender equality if women don't have uh, an ability to be safe in their homes and communities. And yet I want to follow up with this because, of course, in, in much of the country, it's the RCMP that is the, if you like, the local police force responsible for ensuring the safety of women. And yet we are learning over the last several years that the RCMP has its own problem with women not feeling safe on the force itself. Uh, how is the RCMP supposed to protect other women when it doesn't seem able to protect its own? Well, I think that what that speaks to is that it's a cultural problem. It's not, it's not specific to any one organization. It's not specific to any, any one community. Um, it's a cultural pro problem. We, we have uh, an extremely violent, cultural, violent culture, if you will. I mean, the way that men and, and women are encultured to have very strict gender roles plays a role in it. There are so many aspects to why it is so normalized in our society. The language that we use to speak about women that um, are uh, that step out of the gender norm of feminine. Mm -hmm. uh, one woman uh, that spoke at one of the roundtables said, this is an attack on femininity. And that's why transgender and gay people are so at risk. Because when um, transgender, in particular transgender women or gay men that have feminine qualities are, are uh, attacked because of this conceptualization that femininity is a, is a bad thing, especially if it's in someone who's supposedly uh, you know, supposed to be very masculine or male, right, based on their, their biological gender or their birth gender. So I think when you, when you see that, it, you know, endemic in some of our institutions, it's, it shouldn't be shocking because it's a, it's a reflection of a culture. And in, in, in typically very traditionally male-dominated cultures, it can be exacerbated by the way that we recruit, by the way that we train, by the, uh, by the very strong, uh, strict roles that... that, that you know, the men in those particular organizations have to play. How much damage do you think Donald Trump has done to progress on this file? I think whenever we have leaders that are speaking about uh, women in derogatory ways, that are promoting sexual violence, that are normalizing sexual violence, it's extremely harmful. But I also think that whenever um, we have this topic in the national news, it's an opportunity as well. I see uh, one of the biggest challenges that, that we've had is that we, we haven't had a very loud conversation about this. This is, to, in my recollection, recollection some, one of the first times that we're having a truly national conversation about the effects of violence, about um, you know, you, with the launch of the murder to missing Indigenous women, the just how how vulnerable women are and how persistent this problem is in our society. And and uh, I shouldn't say particularly so, but certainly I hear a lot about it as it relates to young women, mm -hmm. and not only bullying in schools, but bullying online as well. Mm -hmm. And and that takes place sort of beyond the the eyes of government much of the time, you know, if it's happening online. How, how can you do anything about the kind of bullying that occasionally results in suicide? Well, the traditional responses, and this is what we've been hearing from young people. I have young people on my advisory council, which has been incredibly helpful. And one of the things that they've told me is that the traditional response of get offline, turn off your, you know, your computer, uh, delete your Facebook or your Twitter account, yeah, it's not, it's not realistic. No, it's and, not it's, and what they're saying is, we have a right to occupy this space as much as men. And what they're asking for is a toolkit. They're asking for what they actually termed harm reduction, which is near and dear to me as someone who's worked in drug policy. What, hap what do we do if we face this kind of uh, targeting? D you know, uh, what they're trying to do is, is learn through trial and error. And sadly, sometimes the response can make the, uh, the abuse even stronger. And so that's something that we're examining with experts, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, and advocates that have been talking about this for a long time. The flip side of that, of course, is that a lot of these social media sites have been set up specifically to be places where speech is free. And you can say whatever the hell you want, no matter what. What do we do about that? Well, that's a large question, and I'm not sure what to do about that yet. But what I can tell you is that we definitely need to address this and talk about it with young women and provide um, provide alternatives to turning off the computer and look at um, 
in some cases, our, our criminal legislation. I'm really uh, fortunate that part of the work that I'll be doing is, will be with the Minister of Justice to take a look at the uh, criminal review that she's doing, the criminal justice review that she's doing, and feed in the suggestions that we've heard from other um, from groups across the country. But we know that criminalization is not going to completely solve this problem. Mm -hmm. It really is going to have going to need multiple approaches. Culture shift, in essence. Absolutely, and mm -hmm. I think the first place is to call it. It's calling it out and talking about it in a very loud way and having public leaders stand up and say this is not okay and you know calling to account um, not just those that are that are uh, perpetrating the behavior but those that are uh, bystanders and facilitating it as well. Get comfy for a second because I'm going to read something from the Globe and Mail here from earlier this year to set okay. up the next part of our discussion. Uh, last month the Globe and Mail reports back in April two women at Brock University in Ontario and the University of Victoria criticized their schools for seemingly protecting the men the women had complained about. Those revelations followed a high-profile case this past winter at UBC where the Equity Office long delayed investigating multiple harassment and assault complaints against a graduate student in the History Department. The student was eventually expelled, but the case hit the national media. Canadians expect more from institutions of learning, and certainly more than the legal system has been able to deliver. In order to protect possible victims in the future, courts put current victims on the stand testing their memories, emotions, and personalities. It may be what justice demands, but the Gian Gomeshi trial showed how awful that process can be to go through. Let me raise the Gomeshi case with you here, because it brought so many of these issues to the forefront in a very chilling way for many women. What do you think is possible in terms of what needs to change in the justice system, on campuses across the country, in the workplace for women, so that if they feel they're being harassed, or sexually assaulted in the workplace, they can actually come forward and have something done about it. Mm -hmm. One of the um, very compelling suggestions that I heard about time and again was the need for women who are coming forward to have legal representation of their own. Mm -hmm. Um, because, in fact, many people think that the Crown is representing the victim, but that's not the case. No. The Crown is prosecuting the case, but they do not have an obligation to support the victim. And so um, many times victims don't know um, what their rights are. They don't know uh, where to turn for other kinds of supports, and, uh, and they're not, they are not being represented through the system. And so Ontario has a pilot program right now where they are offering a, a, a certain amount of free legal uh, advice to victims. I think we need to see more of those kinds of uh, approaches. Is that something um, you want to do? Well, it's certainly something that we're exploring. We're exploring all, we're not, we're not leaving, we're not kicking anything off the table at this point. What we're trying to do is um, address those very real concerns that women are talking about with the judicial system. I think that uh, it's a very complex question that you've asked and you've raised you know, a number of uh, different cases. I think it's really hard to say, here's the sweeping answer for all of those cases. But certainly women have uh, talked over and over about just how difficult it is to come forward, first to the police, as you talked about, but then to make their way through the judicial system alone. And oftentimes, um, they are re-victimized by uh, the telling of testimony, by the, you know, and yet, as you point out, um, in our system, the accused has the right to a fair trial. Well, let me pick up on that, because the other side of the argument that we're also hearing as a result of the Gomeshi case is, if you're accused of murder, if you're accused of stealing something, if you're accused of a drug offense, if you're accused of a white-collar crime, you are innocent until proven guilty, mm -hmm. beyond a reasonable doubt. And yet we are hearing from many groups now that if it's a crime related to the harassment or sexual assault of women, we should believe the woman initially, and in some respects, it's up to the accuser to prove his innocence. I say his against her because it's almost always that way. You got a problem with that at all? Well, I think where the call for believe her is coming from is because we have a history of um, turning a sexual assault, a physical assault of a woman, back on the responsibility of the woman. And we hear this all the time. If she had worn different clothes, if she hadn't been in that place that uh, she had been, if she hadn't had so much alcohol. And I think what the, the movement of believe her is about is to say, 
let's stop accusing the woman of bringing on this violence, bringing on this rape, uh, you know, by her actions. And so, you know, in terms of what should happen with the judicial system, I think that will fall under the purview of my colleague's work, and I'll be very much engaged with that, with her on that. But in terms of where that call is coming from, it's because there has been a consistent drumbeat that if you are attacked as a woman, it's because of something you did. And we have to change the narrative. Women have the right to occupy public spaces as much as men do. I have the right to take a taxi cab and not worry that my my taxi cab driver is a rapist uh, and is going to hurt me this is an example of what we heard when we were we were on the east coast you know the there was a situation in halifax where taxi cab drivers were being accused of sexual assault and the solutions that were being proposed was that the woman should sit in the back seat this mm. is unacceptable the solution should be that that rape should be unacceptable uh, of course uh, i can't quibble with anything you said I do wonder, however, whether or not, and I don't have an answer for this, I'm asking you, you're the minister. I do wonder whether or not there is now something particularly egregious about crimes related to male-on-female violence or male-on-female harassment or assault, whereby men now feel the onus has been reversed, unlike any other crime that you might be charged with nowadays. Are we there now? I don't think so. No? I think we have a far way to go where uh, the men are the disempowered ones and the women are w the ones wielding power, you know, in an uncontrolled way. I think what we what we hear is uh, what we hear is uh, is a fear of a loss of power, and I think that that is ultimately what we're talking about. We're talking about powerful structures and systems that have protected men for a very very long time, all across the board, even broader than violence, and women saying we want to be taken seriously, we want to be protected, we want to have the same rights, we want to be, we want our policies. And and our programs and our structures to reflect our needs as well. And you know, that's the broader work that we're trying to do through Status of Women is using things like gender-based analysis to analyze all of our policies, all of our regulations, all of our laws to say, does this impact women differently than men? And I can guarantee you that that work has not been thoughtfully done in, in many cases for, well, forever, really. Well, we have a self-proclaimed feminist as a prime minister right now, and you've got a majority government, another three years to do something about it. How disappointed are you going to be if you guys don't make significant progress on this while you're in the position you're in? Well, what I, I would say that is, you know, we've always had a patriarchal system. We've always had a system that is controlled largely by men for men. Listen, when I walk through the halls of the parliament, it's never more evident than there. Mm -hmm. When I don't see any uh, or very few women reflecting back at me in terms of the history of our country. So what I, I guess I'm saying is I don't think I'm going to turn this boat around in four years, but I sure I'm going to give it my best shot. Let's finish up on this. Uh, during Women's History Month in October, your ministry launched something called Hashtag Because of Her. What is that? Well, this is um, a campaign to celebrate the contributions of women to Canadian history, but also to communities and to individuals, people's lives. And so what we were um, doing this year was to try to um, broaden the concept of Women's History Week to include um, everyday women, women in our communities that are making history now, if you will. And so uh, we've been just so thrilled with the response. We've seen people use their social media, Facebook, Twitter, to highlight the contributions of women in their own communities. And uh, it's a way to sort of celebrate and to amplify the contributions of women to our country. Who do you, uh, you've probably thought about this before, uh, you must have a top 10 list of who you think the most impactful women in Canadian history are. Who's at the top of your list? Well, I actually think about more in terms of my own community and the people in my life that have um, helped me to succeed. And I think that they would um, have many of the qualities of the Canadian women that have, have demonstrated such commitment and passion. And they're women who have stood up and said, um, you know, despite the challenges that you face, you can, you can achieve your goals. You can, um, you have a voice, use your voice. You have, uh, there is nothing wrong with being assertive. There is nothing wrong with being loud. And it's those women that uh, throughout our history that were not afraid to, uh, to uh, quote unquote, uh, use their power to challenge the status quo that I most admire. Hmm. You, you may be able to see over there, we've got some pictures on the wall of some people who've made an impact in Ontario. And Agnes McPhail's picture is up there as the first female MPP and someone who was pretty good at giving them hell. Absolutely, anyway, absolutely, yes. That's our little contribution to that. Uh, Patty Haidu, Federal Minister for the Status of Women. It's good to have you here at TVO, MP Thunder Bay, Superior North. Best of luck with your portfolio going forward. Thank you very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.